Well, welcome everyone to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar series for the 6th of April. My name is Andrew Heap and I'm the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. Before I introduce our uh, seminar, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. In, the, in a Canberra, we, we are meeting on the uh, lands of the Ngunnawal people. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any other First Nations people participating in our seminar today. So this morning's seminar is our, the first this year of our Distinguished Geoscience Australia lecture series, um, and, or DGALs as we like to call them. And DGALs are awarded by the executive board each year to individuals or teams that give, to give them an opportunity to highlight major research achievements to a wide audience. So congratulations to the team today. As is so often with DGAL presentations, these achievements can represent the culmination of many people and many years of sustained scientific endeavor. And I'm sure this, this day's, uh, the seminar today will be no different. So today's DGAL by a team of expert practitioners in their fields is about an exciting geophysics project entitled High QGA, High Quality Geophysical Analysis. Before I introduce the team, I'll just give you a synopsis of their presentation today. Beginning with a 20 year historical perspective, the presentation will shed light on how persistent focus on innovation and technology by the team directly led to Oz AEM, the world's largest ongoing AEM survey. The team will then discuss how continuing focus on AEM has led to the development of an open framework written in the Julia language for subsurface imaging and uncertainty quantification. This code base is useful to, for geophysical methods beyond AEM such as magnetotellurics and magnetic, magnetic resonance. And finally, several real life examples using the new code base will be presented and the future of AEM at GA and its untapped potential will be outlined. From being a poorly understood qualitative mapping tool, AEM or airborne electromagnetic geophysics has become the mainstay for rapidly imaging the top few hundred meters of the buried earth for a variety of geoscientific and environmental purposes which makes the high QGA project and the work of the team all the more significant to be highlighted today. Before I cross to the team, I'll just give a short introduction to each of them. We've got five presenters today. The first will be Ross Brody, who's a geophysicist with over two decades of experience in Geoscience Australia and its predecessor organizations. And Ross is currently on secondment at CSIRO in Perth. We then have Yusin Leigh Cooper, who is a geophysicist overseeing the acquisition and processing of AM, the world's largest airborne electromagnetic survey. We have Richard Taylor, a physicist with keen interest in machine learning, high performance computing and application of physics to the earth sciences. We then have Megan Mogaham, who is an earth scientist with broad experience across satellite earth observation, mining, computer programming and machine learning. And then an Andrew Ray, who is a geophysicist interested in applying mathematics for natural resource management, exploration and conservation. So welcome to all the presenters and welcome to everyone online. To the and I want to welcome you to the virtual stage and hand over to Ross to begin the presentation. Over to you, Ross. Good, good morning and thank you everybody for attending the High QGA seminar. Before we begin, I need to briefly outline Airborne Electromagnetics, or AEM as we like to abbreviate it, which is the main topic of this talk. AEM involves the acquisition of data along a grid of flight lines using a helicopter or fixed wing aircraft. Perhaps like this beast here, which I first came across in the mid 1990s. Electromagnetics induction data are acquired at regular intervals along the flight lines and are then processed. There are many possible forms of the processed data. One example is shown here where the processed data are composed of vector magnetic field components at different delay times after a transmitted pulse. The process data go through a rigorous mathematical process called inversion that adheres to the physics of EM to produce estimates or models of the subsurface electrical conductivity that would explain the measured data. 
the conductivity estimates can then be interpreted as a pseudo 3D representation of the subsurface, like shown here. By the early 1990s, Geoscience Australia had a wealth of in-house expertise in airborne geophysics. Through, um, through having operated multiple aeromagnetic and radiometric aircraft and had developed many of its own leading data processing methods. GA's journey with airborne electromagnetics began in 1990 three with uh, the overseeing of several so-called fly-offs between the Questum and Geotem systems to assess the suitability of these systems to salinity mapping. Geo became more involved with AEM in 1997 when five small pilot studies were commissioned for the National Airborne Geophysics Project, which was aimed at evaluating AEM for dry land salinity risk mapping. Our role was in drafting the technical specifications and managing the data acquisition and processing. For these surveys, the more suitable digim and salt map systems were now available. At this time, the contractors were not supplying conductivity depth estimates or cross section. It was a bit of a case of any model at all will do, please. Nonetheless, the potential of AEM was, however, realised through the qualitative interpretation of the spatial patterns in the images of the AEM data themselves. If I remember correctly, this ternary image of three EM data channels was responsible for identifying the existence of the paleo channel, which is uh, outlined coming through here, um, under the Lake Tulliban, which was an important wetland in WA. It was later targeted for pumping to lower the water table. This was an early success. The next stage was the Gilmore project in 1999 when the better calibrated Tempest system, which had been developed in the Australian Mineral Exploration Cooperative uh, Technologies Cooperative Research Centre, was first flown on a production survey in a joint mineral systems and land management survey. This was our first step towards quantitative AEM. We process the data with the EM flow fast approximate imaging software to generate conduct activity depth estimate models. EMflow, which had also come out of the CRC, began to give us very useful conductivity depth estimates to bring in the all important third dimension. I think the CRC investments by government were critical in getting AEM to where it is today. The following year, we managed and processed data from surveys flowing over the Gawler Craton with a minerals focus. It was in 2002 that we began to develop our own deterministic 1D layered earth inversion capability. This was for the Riverland AEM survey that was flown for the South Australian Salinity Mapping and Monitoring Support Project. We developed the software because we needed to have greater control over the conductivity estimation process and to solve specific constrained inversion problems that were not available off the shelf. This led to a similar demand for inversion products for the National Action Plan for salinity and water quality. With the development of inversion programs, we were now getting much more quantitative results that adhered to the true physics. However, inversion was also began to expose serious systematic calibration errors in the electromagnetic data and showed the importance of accurate ancillary information that the, like the system geometry. 
From here, we continue to develop our algorithm to handle these systematic errors by identifying and correctly modeling the errors sources rather than sweeping them under the carpet or massaging the data. The lower Boulogne survey was 28,000 line kilometres, the largest one um, at that time. And we were running the, uh, the compute hungry inversions on desktop PCs in a SETI style distributed arrangement where I would offer a coffee or a chocolate bar or a bottle of wine to whoever's computer could invert the most soundings for us. By the time the 2006-2007 Bureau of Rural Sciences series of land management surveys came around, we had matured the inversion process into a relatively routine procedure and fully paralysed the code to run on the in-house Linux cluster computer at GA that had now become available. Next came the onshore energy security program in 2007 to 10, which began the GA's foray into regional scale AEM mapping at five kilometre wide line spacing. Strong in-house geological synthesis and interpretation of these surveys within our regional geology projects meant regional AEM had a future at GA. By the end of the OSP, we had moved our inversion to the National Computational Infrastructure Supercomputer, which allowed us to routinely run inversions for quality control purposes. The next milestone was when the groundwater team commissioned a large SkyTem survey for the Broken Hill Managed Aquifer Recharge Project in 2009. Further surveys were managed for the state agencies and at this time we began implementing and, and trialling stochastic inversion of AEM data, the results from which were first released with the Southern Thompson survey in 2014. At around this time we also open sourced the GA AEM source code on GitHub. The next milestone was the kickoff of the Oz AEM regional mapping program in 2017, which is in the process of completing an impressive national coverage at 20 kilometre line spacing. I will now hand over to Yusin Lay Cooper to give you the details of this impressive program. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk uh, to you about our national acquisition program, specifically the AM. Ross has done a great job just giving you a little bit of the historics. Um, I'll try and, and put things um, in another context with a few examples and things. So as we all know, airborne surveys are really cost effective tools for mapping and managing Earth resources. Their non-invasive nature allows remote exploration with little to no disturbance. They are high density data sets um, with that. We get a reading from these surveys at approximately 15 meters. We get uh, a sounding, uh, a measure. So imagine doing that on the ground or drilling at that resolution. Jay with our state partners and um, from the states and the, and the territory geological surveys for over the past for over the past 50 to 60 years have systematically acquired and merged surveys to cover most of the Australian continent. Um, our modeling and inversion tools, which we'll hear more about, are far reaching worldwide. Through our modeling, we can level the surveys we have acquired to create seamless images like the one you have on screen. Um, so far, we have flown over 56% of Australia's total area with Airborne M. This is a huge achievement. Nowhere else in the world has this sort of coverage. 56% of Australia accounts to approximately 3% of the world's total land area. Just think about that for a bit. It's a massive achievement. 
Um, the reason why geophysical techniques are so important in the Australian context is about 80% of Australia is under some sort of cover. So we need geophysical methods to infer what lays beneath. AEM unveils what you cannot see by satellites or by, naked, by the naked eye. In this image, you can see some of the paleo channels the AEM is mapping. Those are those little red squiggle conductors there, mostly. Um, you can easily see how products like the water observations from, say, from space can be used in conjunction with the AEM to identify places of surface and groundwater interactions. Why should these programs or initiatives be funded? I think it's very straightforward. No other country in the world has the quality and the coverage of our geophysical data sets. The, dra the gravity, the magnetics and the radiometrics, which have been known as our crown jewels, are the envy of several countries. I will briefly show you in the next few slides um, some recent examples of the US of the use of AM, maybe in less conventional areas than the ones you might have previously seen. We are acquiring data sets that can address more than one specific research question, most probably some questions that are still to be asked. So um, we we map a lot of our geology through the magnetics. That's what we have done so far in places where there's no real outcrop. So you stand at the surface and you can see nothing. So we need these geophysical methods to map. I can see the next generation and refinement of our mapping will be done with the AM, which has the ability to give us information about the depth, a limitation that the potential fields have. Here in this example, you can see the Bonaparte Basin there on the left, how nicely it's been imaged by the AM. So just briefly, how we go from vaults to geology. The reality is the models that we generate and the inversions that Ross told you um, about, you know, of running those, those algorithms on, on the computers, on the desktops, and now on the SCI, that's, that's where um, we do our interpretation. These models are what enable us to do the interpretation. AEM data by itself, is not geologically interpretable. As you can see there in the third panel from, from the bottom, that's what we get. AEM is just values of volts varying through um, time at a particular location. Now, have a, if I can draw your attention to the top uh, left corner, look at how the AEM gives us an insight to the deformation. It's just fantastic. You have surface expression and now we can have estimates of um, what's going on below. Uh, we are generating a multi-purpose data set and this is very important. We kind of tend to get pigeonholed that uh, Geoscience Australia we do things for one or other purpose and it's not the case. Um, we previously heard about how GA started using AM for groundwater conservation. This is a little example back from 2003 with a CRC met um, in the Chowila floodplains there in the border between South Australia and Victoria. And we we this was used to try and determine um, salinity and porosity in the area. You can see there on the right the stack of um, the geomorphology from the LIDAR, and then a groundwater table, and then porosity and salinity estimates. Uh, our colleagues in the USGS have just flown Yellowstone, which is a um, conservation park, and a, um, a national park, and it's been impressive. Um, it was the first time they have determined the plumbing of the system that links the deep thermal fluids to the well-known um, surface features that are so iconic in Yellowstone. And that was revealed through Airborne EM. Um, we, before Anand, has showed you um, the importance of flying in places like Antarctica, where AEM has been used to determine ice thickness in the brine in channels within the ice. Of course, there's a more conventional um, use of AM that people would be more familiarized with. This is an ASX release um, where you can see the mag in plan view and one of our profiles that they have 
um, kind of made up into a nice diagram here. And it's interesting um, on the left here, if you see on the on, on the right panel on, on you can see there's a strong anomaly on the left, um, which when we're designing the surveys, we have flown over known deposits and boreholes. Just in the interest of using these as proxies, the release says how a proven de deposit on the West, which has an estimate of 1.2 million tons of nickel, has similar um, responses to the, the strong EM anomalies on the right that are currently being followed. And just to, to finish, there's an angle to the community safety hazards um, angle of, of the use of these, these data sets. This is a borrowed example from our Norwegian colleagues. For all of you who like Scandin Scandinavian nor, it's um, the, Nor the Norway creeping rock and debris area. So here is a very simple three layer problem where you have sheets, sheets of phyllite, which are a conductive, um, where are a conductive tergite. And I'll show you how, how it was used. So here you can see um, those names are um, communities. Right, and you can see what's happening there in threat of line of landslides. So that's that's the problem that they're trying to deal. Um, so they flew an airborne EM survey in two days. Uh huh. Two hundred and fifty kilometers were flown in very hard terrain, as you can see. And what's what we have here is a conductivity draped over the topography where, um, as I said, the target there on the profile you can see is the red conductors, where these phyllites act like slides where the more resistive nicest move and pose a threat to the community. So I leave it there and um, I'll stop say, um, sharing my screen. So, um... Well, thank you, Yusan, for setting the stage with those uh, beautiful images of the various things that we can be using AEM4 and those national data sets. Um, as Yusan mentioned, here's actually a helicopter with a transmitter loop and a receiver at the back, and it's collecting this, this very useful, what we like to call pre-competitive data at, at various times. Um, but that pre-competitive data at any instant looks like this. and. Uh, if you look closely, if, if you have the resolution on your screen, on this axis where I'm moving my mouse, it's volts. And on this axis, it's seconds. And so this doesn't look anything like geology. So we have to put it through this process of mathematical inversion, as um, Ross Brody mentioned, and do some computer stuff to it to get something that is relatable to geology. And so there's that red guy over there. And that's actually a property of the Earth, that's resistivity with depth. And so now we're beginning to look into the Earth in, in the depth dimension. However, there's uncertainty associated with that. And that's the uh, fuzzy black lines you see in the background, what we like to call swarm plots. Wherever the, uh, the fuzz is darker, uh, that's more certain. And as we get deeper, it's less certain. But this is at only one location. And what we have to do then is we have to do this at all the locations that the um, helicopter or, or the aircraft flew over, and we are able to visualize a section um, such as this. And then uh, this has to be done and then interpreted. And in, after you do the interpretation of, of uh, the section where these reds represent what are very conducting features, and they could be something like a, a clay or a saline aquifer, and um, the blues are very resistive features. They could be a crystalline basement or something like that, but it needs to be interpreted. So you want to get from this point to this point. And I like to think of this as, as a kitchen. So this is, this is the food that we want to eat, right? And so if you're thinking of a nice uh, Michelin star restaurant, I would, I would encourage you to think of our project as a bit of a, as a master chef kind of uh, uh, enterprise. And um, we really need some really good tools to be able to make the, uh, the geology uh, ingestible because we have to go from volts to geology. And so I'll be talking about the tools next. And in terms of tools, um, we've built ourselves a, a framework uh, in the open source language, Julia, which can handle various kinds of data. Um, so here we've got airborne electromagnetics, uh, which can uh, show you conductivity in the earth to a few hundreds of meters. Uh, we can also handle magnetotelluric data uh, which can handle um, conductivity in the earth and, and give you an, an inference of conductivity in the earth to, to hundreds of kilometers depth. 
or there's this exciting new technique over here called surface magnetic resonance, which Richard will talk to you about in a, in a few minutes, um, where again, um, we can tell you up to depths of a few hundred meters or so at, at the maximum about where the water content is in the earth. Or um, this, this framework can also help you um, non-linearly uh, regress um, spatial data like a, a velocity field or, or geochemical data. And so if I give you uh, the decimated a bunch of points over here, I can actually interpolate that uh, non-stationarily and, and give you this, this image that looks like a, suspiciously like a milk drop over there. So you can think of this framework that we built as like a mathematical uh, Swiss knife, but it's, it's also made of Lego. So we can sort of plug in the modules that we want and we're not limited to the, to the Swiss knife that uh, you know, the manufacturer has given us. It's, it's completely extensible. Um, Getting to the real world, here's the, the Great Artesian Basin that's uh, outlined in yellow. And um, uh, this is a helicopter survey that was carried out to image the, the intake beds of the world's largest and deepest aquifer. Uh, this was a survey carried out last year. That's the helicopter setting up and that's the helicopter in motion. Um, and so this gives you an idea of, of, the, of the ranges um, uh, which, which we cover. Uh, if you look closely, in, in orange are the uh, track lines of the um, uh, survey itself. And um, how is it that we were able to image the subsurface? So first of all, this is what the data looks like. This green stuff, that's the data. So we have to convert that into geology. And um, if you have to use some kind of software, you know that if you've been looking at things till late in the, in the evening, say you're looking at, a, at an Excel spreadsheet till late in the evening, um, when, you, when, you, when you're back the next morning, it's, it's difficult to figure out where you left off. However, if we do things in a scriptable way, like we've done over here, um, in a notebook style format, then you can just pick up where you left off. And, and that's great. So let's see how that lets us convert these bits of green and yellow into geology. Look at that. Now, if I flip between these two slides, does this look anything like geology? But this looks like geology. So we've done the conversion of volts to geology. And here you can see these reds, which are again conducting features, which could be clays or aquitards. And you can see these blues, which are to first order resistive features, which could be where water seeps into the Great Artesian Basin through. And for those of you who would like to think of this in terms of geology, look at that. So this is in Canberra itself, just outside the uh, national capital. So you see these beautiful dipping layers and there's an unconformity. Uh, but notice that there's this massive road <laughs> That's actually going through the hill. But we can't go into Queensland and just dig up the place and, and have massive roads going through so you can get cross sections through the earth, right? You can't do that, which is why we use geophysics. That's how we see inside the earth. Um, there's also uncertainty associated with these images of the earth because the helicopter is flying uh, 50 to 60 meters if it's a fixed wing aircraft even higher than that. Um, so it's looking at things from some distance away. So there's uncertainty within the earth. So we can give you various models of what the Earth looks like. And if you look at the common features between these models, those are the ones that you can be very certain of. So not only can we show you what the Earth looks like, we can show you what you can be certain for. And finally, this is what is um, integral to be able to make 3D models of the Earth. So this is some work done uh, both at Geoscience Australia and our partner agencies such as CSIRO. This is the Great Artesian Basin. Um, this is a cross-section through the Great Artesian Basin. There's the shape of the uh, Great Artesian Basin again. And I've just put in a line over there that shows you where we flew. And I'm going to bring in our section to show you how compatible that is with these kinds of conceptualizations. So look to the top right, and I'm going to bring that. And look at that. So you, you, you see the, the Great Dividing Range. Then you see the kinds of dipping beds um, that are visible on your screen. And, and this is what lets you make these kinds of huge models from, from uh, geophysical data that are acquired on the surface. And I'll let Negan and Richard talk about this some more in, in detail. Thank you, Anand. Um, so, so far we heard about HiQGA probabilistic inversion package and how uh, it has a very close ties to Julia programming language. So I would take you to a new case study that uh, recently we were handed over by one of our contractors who um, basically flew over part of the Western Australia using a new AEM system and wanted us to give some feedback. Um, this actually definitely strengthened our private and public partnership. 
The data was collected approximately 60 kilometers north of Perth, an area called Jinjin, a long 35 kilometer line. And as you can see on the left, from the coast towards uh, Darling Scarp. This data um, has been collected using uh, an upgraded transmitter with increased sampling rate that uh, our contractor wanted actually to test uh, within this experiment. So um, basically, as you can see on the right, the inversion results for conductivity using high QGA probabilistic package um, present a very good results uh, because the data fits properly. However, quality check of the data set, in particular for the uh, geometry of the aircraft, reveals an underlying uh, issues with the um, calculated uh, attitude of the aircraft. So I would like to say that some of those quality check of the data um, presents some of the irregularities within the data set and actually supports us to make uh, proper decisions whether the data is reliable reliable for further processing. It also supports our uh, contractors to improve their instrumentation. Um, coming back to the open source angle of high QGA, I just want to briefly mention my journey to meet Julia and also how Julia looked like for me as a newcomer in this realm uh, for programming language. So I first met Julia when I was at the Pacific Geoscience Center um, on west coast of Canada, where seismologists were using this programming language for developing advanced learning algorithms to extract into seismic events. And uh, it took me like four years to finally being able to expose to uh, this programming language in an operational level within geophysical acquisition and processing team. Julia as a language is fairly new, uh, free and also modern. It has a high level quality as a programming language. Uh, it presents the speed of C and dynamism of Ruby. It is powerful like MATLAB for linear algebra and you can find true macros like Lisp in Julia. Uh, if you are interested in general programming using Python, uh, Julia is actually appropriate for that as well. For me that spent most of my time uh, basically coding in the Python, it was a bit daunting when I was uh, stepping into the Julia realm in order to be involved with this collaboration within the high QGA code base. However, I found Julia programming language uh, documentation online free and pro, pro, uh, potentially very comprehensive and detailed. Uh, I took some training courses, uh, including National Computation Infrastructure free uh, training for Julia, and it gave me some confidence to dig into the high QGA repository. As you can see, the link is available here at the top of this slide to go in more in, into the details of the repository and the code. There is some directory in the high QGA uh, repository that if you are interested to have a crack on. There are some examples for different types of AEM systems that you can actually have a test. For instance, here I show the Tempest one. As you can see on the right, there are three major uh, steps that you need to take. One is making the model that actually reads and parses the data. Then uh, the next step will be actually setting up your inversion code and um, basically introducing your priors and uh, sampler. And then uh, you will be able to set up your um, parallel uh, kind of workflow for running the test of your inversion on NCI. If you are interested to try some of our plotting scripts, you are more than welcome to try the plot results, which is also available for your use. Um, each of these subdirectories for each of those AEM systems uh, have their own uh, templates that is uh, very helpful if you are interested to look at the templates, how the input data should look like. And um, with this, I would like to actually hand over to my colleague Richard for his contribution to the development of high QGA code. Thank you for your attention. All right, so uh, we've already kind of spoken a little bit about this high QGA open source package, uh, specifically through the lens of the airborne electromagnetic geophysical technique. Uh, but what I, what I want to talk about is really the utility of this sort of open source modular framework to deal with a whole bunch of different sort of geophysical techniques. Uh, so we've designed it, so it's basically this uh, kind of 
Uh, it's modular. It just does the sort of Bayesian statistical sampling to give you a probabilistic model uh, based on your data of whatever geophysical parameter that you're interested in. Uh, and the benefit of this is you can basically plug in whatever sort of physics, the geophysics technique that you would like uh, into this open source package. So specifically today, I'm going to talk about two examples of this uh, that I've worked on. Uh, first, the surface magnetic resonance technique. Uh, so you can see an example of some uh, modeling of this here, uh, and also an improvement that I made to the modeling for a fixed wing airborne electromagnetic system. Uh, so beginning with the surface magnetic resonance techniques, this is actually quite different to the airborne electromagnetics that have been discussed uh, so far in this seminar. Uh, so this is actually a surface geophysics technique uh, that is uh, looking for basically the magnetic response of water molecules uh, underneath the ground. So uh, the principle, the operating principle of this technique is actually uh, quite similar to if you've ever been to a hospital and had an MRI done. Uh, so basically there's a magnetic field uh, that is used to kind of probe the location of water molecules in your body in order to give you images of, say, I don't know, your brain or something uh, using an MRI. Uh, so what surface magnetic resonance is, is basically doing an MRI on the ground. Uh, so you may have some groundwater underneath the surface. Um, and the Earth's magnetic field uh, is providing a sort of static field. And then if you have a surface loop uh, on the surface to provide an exciting pulse, then you can actually measure the response directly uh, of these water molecules uh, to uh, that magnetic field. Um, and by doing this, this is a sort of near, near surface geophysical technique that is specifically targeting water. So it's really useful uh, for studies of uh, yeah, groundwater. Um, so what we've done recently uh, at Geoscience Australia we, is we've actually developed a really high performance uh, forward modeling code uh, for this surface magnetic resonance technique. And so you can see this sort of psychedelic looking image on the left hand side here. So this is actually the result of our forward modeling code showing the sensitivity of different regions in the subsurface to a given surface magnetic resonance uh, loop. Uh, and so we had this sort of high performance forward modeling code um, and we uh, the goal uh, of the project was to develop a kind of probabilistic Bayesian inversion uh, of where is the groundwater from the surface magnetic resonance data set. And so leveraging the extensibility, the modular nature of the high QGA framework, we were actually able to produce this quite quickly from the forward modeling code with minimal extra code to make it work and actually come up with these sort of probabilistic estimates um, of water content underneath the ground. So where is the groundwater basically? Uh, so you can see examples here where we've tested this firstly with a synthetic model where we know what the true distribution of water is that we've modeled. So that's the sort of uh, dashed black line here. Um, and you can see, so this is basically a probability distribution of water content. So this is the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. So this is kind of like a credible or confidence interval of like what the water content could be at this depth. Uh, but we've also started applying this to real uh, surface magnetic resonance data sets. Uh, so we actually have available to us at Geoscience Australia, uh, the largest um, surface magnetic resonance survey that we're aware of in the world that we're going to apply this uh, high QGA surface magnetic resonance probabilistic inversion to uh, in order to uh, sort of work towards large scale probabilistic inference of uh, groundwater properties using this geophysical technique. Um, so that's the surface magnetic resonance technique. Uh, so the second example I want to discuss uh, is the example of geometric nuisances in a fixed wing airborne electromagnetic system. So when you are um, flying an AEM survey, uh, the signal that you get back doesn't just depend on the geophysical parameter you're interested in. So the conductivity model of the Earth, these sigmas here. Uh, it also depends on the geometry of the system. So the things like the height of the transmitter, the difference in height between the transmitter and receiver, and also uh, roll pitch and yaw angles for the transmitter and receiver loops. Uh, and so this is going to affect the signal that you get back and you need to understand what these geometry parameters are well in order that your inversion of the thing that you're interested in is actually of a high quality. And so what we have done is we've actually extended the Bayesian framework using high QGA uh, to actually give a simultaneous Bayesian inversion of some of these geometry nuisance parameters as well. 
Uh, and so we can see an example here where we've performed this type of inversion with these. So this is XRX means the sort of horizontal separation between transmitter and receiver uh, for the AEM system. And we can see in uh, the orange dots are kind of the reported uh, value for this geometry parameter. And the blue line and the shaded region are sort of the credible interval for high QGA's inversion of this parameter. So we can actually see that the result based on the inversion uh, is significantly different and actually outside the credible interval for a lot of these soundings. And so we can see here that by actually incorporating this inversion uh, of this ge geometric parameter, we're going to actually improve um, the understanding of the geophysical parameter we're interested in, the, interested in, the conductivity, uh, because um, if we were using this sort of biased, uh, incorrect estimate of this geometric parameter, then our inversion of the signal to the conductivity would actually be also biased and incorrect. Uh, so another thing this allows us to do is look at how uh, different kinds of geometry error uh, result in correlated changes to the signal. Uh, so you can see here, this is kind of a histogram uh, using this inversion of different values of the pitch of the receiver. So it's angle kind of this way if the aircraft is flying that way. Uh, and also the vertical separation between the receiver and the transmitter. And we can see these are actually really strongly correlated. And what that allows us to do is say, okay, well, maybe we only need to invert for one of these to get a good estimate, which reduces the computational cost. But for both of these examples, what we've really done is with fairly minimal development time, actually just plugged in new physics into this modular Bayesian inversion framework. And that's really what high QGA is all about. It enables you to extend it however you would like. It's open source, so you can contribute it to it and add your own geophysics and get uh, the benefit of these inversions uh, with uncertainty uh, in a Bayesian way. So I'll hand over to Anand for the last part of the seminar. So thank you, Richard. Um, in fact, uh, that, that was a very good point from which to start on uh, some of the uh, contractor technology assessment that we're, we're doing. So some of the images that Richard showed you on his last slide were from the Menindee calibration range, which is in New South Wales, right about there. Um, I apologize for not being able to take off my favorite restaurants on the uh, East Coast. Those are the uh, little stars that you see there, but we, we won't talk about that. Um, so the Menindee test range is about there. Zooming in, uh, we can see the Menindee lakes and that yellow line is actually a 15 kilometer long uh, calibration line, which we can zoom into again over there. So it goes over dry land and the salt lake. Sometimes it's, it's filled with a lot of water depending on the weather conditions. And we know what's going on on the ground there because we've actually got boreholes or as my uh, friend and colleague, Tim Evans likes to say, vertical lie detectors. So if we're imaging the subsurface there, we, we actually know in certain places what it looks like. And this provides an ideal proving ground for our uh, vendors, whether they be flying helicopter systems or um, fixed wing systems like you see over there. Now, um, here's an image and um, two images actually. One section is from a fixed wing system and the next row um, is, is from uh, either a helicopter system or a fixed wing system. I'm not gonna tell you. and um, I'd like to point out these boreholes that are these vertical lines that you see over here. And again, reds are conducting and blues are resistive. And what I would like to draw your attention to is it doesn't matter which image you look at, um, the top one or the bottom one, um, we're able to match the reds in the section of geology that we've inferred from the voltage data or the magnetic field data that we actually receive at our sensors and make it into conductivity within the earth. Um, and when we've done that, they match really well with our vertical lie detectors or boreholes where we've actually gone and measured the resistivity or conductivity within the earth. And um, you know, to, to, to a good approximation, you can sort of see, well, the topography is obvious. We're getting into the lake over here. Uh, you can see perhaps these are um, uh, uh, salts that are uh, saturated with water. So they, they tend to be very conducting. And so you can see that conducting layer over there. You can see that conducting subsurface layer over there. And perhaps as you go deeper down, uh, this is the basinal part of, of the lake. You can see that in both images, uh, tends to be a little more resistive. You can see perhaps what are uh, conducting clays as well. 
And, and everywhere, there's excellent match between the boreholes, that are these vertical lines, and uh, the, uh, the background image. And, and we haven't had to do any adjustment. And what this is telling us is that you know, both technologies, whether fixed wing or helicopter, are, are good value for taxpayer money. And we haven't taken the vendor's word for it, um, but we've actually done this uh, due diligence ourselves and, and ensured best value for the Australian taxpayer. Now, this ability to be able to check our systems and make sure that any vendors who are on our deeds um, have a very high technical capability. And so this lets us rapidly deploy to the field. So this is a survey which started last week. And this is also in New South Wales. There's uh, Menindee Lakes again. Uh, there's the town of Broken Hill. This is about a 130 or 140 kilometer long line uh, in yellow over there. And um, again, you can see that we can quality check this. If you're underneath the black line over there, that means that most of the data are, are uh, readily analyzable. We can find uncertainty on what the subsurface looks like. It's too early to put on any interpretation because that's what our teams here will do. And I, I will not uh, go where angels fear to tread. Um, but yeah, so this, this means that we're very quickly able to deploy um, um, you know, at an operation scale and also improve our, our code at the same time because there is this agile workflow loop that we're all going through. And um, we can do this because of, of the experience in our team. So I'd like to leave you with the functionality that's available um, in, in the uh, Julia code that you see over here. Um, I'm not gonna read all that out right now. As Negan said, please go to our um, GitHub page, go to Geoscience Australia's GitHub page and, and have a look at what's available. And finally, uh, this is an excellent slide that my friend and colleague Neil Symington put together. Um, so I'd like you to think of your favorite search engine um, and the fact that uh, you know they're they're able to make a lot of money from the fact that they invest in in the technologies and statistics and and the people that understand these statistics around you know searching the internet for things that you're interested in, and and for the most part the data is free because we're signing up in hordes to provide them that data, right? So what then they, they what they then do is that they crunch through that data and they provide some useful information from from that data to all of us, which is which is priceless. And so the investment part in the technology is, is large, but the data is priceless and they're getting that data for free. So we've done something similar over here, or I should say Neil has. Uh, this is on the Western deserts in, in Australia. And um, this is a bunch of industry data, which again, is just you know, your magnetic field or voltage data, which he's used the math mathematical process of inversion to, to convert into um, subsurface images of conductivity. So zooming in, here is the near surface conductivity and you can see these beautiful paleo channels that have been uh, imaged. And you can also look at these things in, in 3D. Uh, that's what we see over here. He's also provided a very nice perspective image. Um, but one thing I would like you to keep in mind is that this is what the data would look like for um, any one of these lines. And this data doesn't look anything like the beautiful geology. So you've got to do this conversion of data into these beautiful 3D images that you see over here, and that requires physics. So that's one crucial difference between, say, you know, the search engine companies that have all their great statistical algorithms, because statistics is not enough for us. And this is a highly misunderstood thing in, in subsurface imaging. Surface data are not enough. You've got to have physics to be able to convert that data into um, something that is digestible for geologists like this. And finally, um, you know, this is this is our secret sauce, as I like to call it. We we convert data into models. Uh, we show you the uncertainty around those models, and, and we can do all of these things. But it requires a team of people, and if you invest in people, and I feel a little bit like uh, Robin Williams from that movie uh, Patch Adams. You can never lose. You really can't, um, because while doing our work, we're able to convert all that uh, technical experience into training. And as we all know, that you know. Trick Innovation doesn't come from someone waking up on the side of their bed and saying, oh, I'm going to have this great idea today. It does require a lot of sustained effort. It requires discipline. And um, to end on that uh, kitchen theme, um, all good kitchens need uh, a wise and experienced chef. So that's all of us uh, clustered around Ross Brody in there, who's a um, very long and illustrious career with Geoscience Australia and its predecessor organizations. This really allowed us to uh, um, have this capability and offer it to the Australian uh, public um, relatively easily. 
So uh, thank you very much. I will uh, leave it there. And uh, if there's any questions. Thanks, Anand. And thanks, team, for a wonderful presentation. I've learned something new today, nuisance parameters. That's a great, that's a great term. I think I might use that every uh, now and then in my in some of my other conversations around the building. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we've got a few questions, Some of one of which has been answered already. Uh, we have a bit of time, which is about, can you use um, use the uh, same sort of techniques to the seafloor? And there's, there's an answer in the, chat there, in the chat there, which I'll leave people to read. Uh, but there's a few more questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is from Gareth Davies, which is, does the forward modeling code need to be written in Julia as opposed to interfacing with another language? Who would like to answer that? Um, I think uh, Richard could answer that uh, relatively uh, uh, easily. Uh, so I have just popped an answer in the chat, but I'll restate it here for everyone. Um, so basically, you don't need to write the forward modeling code in Julia uh, because Julia actually has like libraries that let you call other languages from it. So like most notably, I think the one that works best is Python, but there's also a way you can uh, call C and C++ code from Julia. Uh, so we've done that in the past with a previous version of our AEM forward modeling code that was originally written in C++. Um, so the comment I would make there is you don't need to write the forward model in Julia, but if you write it in something else, you'll need to write the wrapper so that Julia can call your forward model and that'll need to be written in Julia. Great, thanks Richard. Our next question is from Asbjorn Christensen who says, any frequency domain AEM inversion code available? Okay, I can, I can, I can take that. Um, and, and Ross, please feel free to, uh, you know, correct me if, uh, you know, if there's a better answer. So, you know, to, to get to the time domain, all our modeling is implicitly done in the frequency domain. It's just that all the systems that we currently or are using very prevalently right now happen to be time domain systems. But it, it shouldn't be that much of a problem to convert, um, you know, our, our modeling engines uh, into being able to handle uh, frequency domain data because that is the domain we, we start in. However, uh, frequency domain systems, uh, as, as both Usain and Russ will tell you, can be a bit of a beast because of the various parts they have to them. Um, but, you know, it, it, it isn't impossible because implicitly we're starting all our modeling in, in the frequency uh, domain. Great, thanks, Anand. Uh, unless Ross has any qualifying statements, I might move um, on to the. Yeah, I, I could just add that yes, it is in the uh, GAAMC um, repository, but it's. Um, Edgeborn has asked me this question several times over the years. Um, it's not quite uh, documented or um, in a in a state that is nicely ingestible for you at the moment. Okay, thanks Ross. Uh, we have another question from Ned Stoltz who says, any way of automatically flagging 2D and 3D features which are not imaged properly by the 1D algorithm? Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll have a go with that. Yeah, so the thing is, and this is a, this is a discussion, I'll, I'll I'll paraphrase Steve Constable, the the uh, the author of uh, one of the authors of Occam's inversion. So, you know, if you can fit it in 1D, there's there's not a good reason to go to 2D or 3D, right? So, um, because you're just adding more dimensions and you're sort of squaring or cubing the uncertainty. Um, I think the easiest way to be able to figure out whether you're looking at 2D or 3D effects is if you can't fit the data. So, in 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 the plot that I showed, there was like a, a black line showing you the the, if, if you've been able to fit the data to within the noise. So if you can't do that, there's a good bet that if it's not system geometry related or something wonky about the flight, it, it's probably a 2D or 3D effect. So you can look at the misfit and, and zoom in on areas saying, oh, that looks interesting, it doesn't fit. And perhaps ask the ground geophysics team to go in there or you know, invert it in 2D or 3D. All right, thanks, Anand. Uh, great comment there by Mark. That's bit around uh, the kitchen having an induction cooktop. Um, but I think my old, for the last question, I'll go to Marina Costello, which is whether you can provide an example of how the team have improved the contractor's data quality for everyone, industry, academia, and government. An example, yes, I certainly can do that. Um, 
So, you know, this, this uh, Tempest system, um, and, and that's something that Negin uh, showed as well. Um, uh, you know, so Ross has spent a lot of time in, in being able to figure out the uh, geometry parameters around, um, uh, you know, being able to image the Earth correctly. And, and that sort of has, has improved, um, led to this paradigm shift into, into how we image subsurface conductivity. And um, because we're now able to, as, as Richard also showed, uh, place, um, you know, the, the nuisances, because we're not really interested in, in the yaw and the pitch and the role of the transmitter and the receiver, but, but they do affect how, how we are able to image the earth. And, and so we're able to put them in that proper place and we're also, as, as Negin showed, um, able to, to help them with developing uh, new systems. And so this is, this is a great example of, of public-private partnership. You, you invest in us and our knowledge, and um, you know, we're able to um, give you all of this expertise from, from various you know, uh, kinds of capabilities and, and backgrounds from theoretical physics to applied geophysics. And then we put it out there in, in the public domain. And, and this allows you to have a better imaging system which everybody can use. So um, yes, I think there's some very, very good examples of that which we have um, uh, demonstrated over many years now. I, if I could just jump in very quickly, like the, the greatest example of that is just through time showing the importance of this and what what impact it has on the quality of the data some of the contractors have sort of everything from using our software now to deliver their conductivity values to the clients but also on the hardware and the acquisition kind of adding um GPS on their receivers and, and um, inertia movement units on, on their receivers too. So yes, absolutely. I think we we are having an influence and an impact on, on the industry to that extent. Yep. Great. Thanks, Jason. Look, uh, I'll wrap it up there in terms of the questions. There's a couple of extra questions there and comments in the chat. I'll, I'll leave the team to answer those in their own time um, if they can. But look, please join me in thanking Ross, Yusin, Richard, Negan, and, and Anne for a wonderful presentation today, demonstrating while over all the work that they've done over many years is why they're deserving of a Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecture Award. So congratulations to you all and thanks very much. Um, um, the next, um, next week's... Um, seminar is uh, we're taking a bye for a couple of weeks because of ACT school holidays. So the next Wednesday seminars will return on the April the 20th when Dr. David Dewhurst, um, a chief research scientist at CSIRO, uh, will be joining us um, to present a, a presentation entitled The Impact of the Diagenesis on Rock Properties and Shales. And Dr. Dewhurst will use examples from the Marcellus Shale and two Ordovician Canning Basin Shales to highlight the strong impact that organic matter minerals and their transformation during diagenesis can have on the evolution of rock properties. And then emphasize that multidisciplinary studies can be crucial to unraveling often complex geological history and shell formation. So, so thank you everyone again for joining, uh, for being there today. Thanks to the team, wonderful presentation, wonderful work as the uh, uh, comments come in. And please join us again on the 20th to learn more about Dave Dewhurst's uh, study. Thank you, bye for now. Thanks Andrew, bye-bye.